do it anyway. Here we go. Angels from the realms of glory wing your flight o'er all the earth. He who sang creation story now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages, leave your contemplations, Brighter visions beam afar. Seek the great desire of nations. Ye have seen the infant star. Come and worship, come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, Watching long in hope and fear, suddenly the Lord descending in his temple shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn. pray. Father, thank you so much for this season. Thank you for the, the time that we have now to focus in on what this season is about, what the angels sang about, that first Noel, that first night, the coming of the Messiah. And Lord, we await your, await your return today in this modern era just as anxiously as they did then. So Father, help us keep our focus on you, the true meaning of Christmas as we celebrate your birth in your name. Amen. The first Noel the angel did say was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No
Good morning. Well, Christmas season is here. Christmas is fast approaching. Everybody got their gifts all bought? <laughs> Who can remember the best Christmas gift they ever got? Did you want to share it? I grew up with two older brothers. And we tend to break things. So we never shared any of our Christmas gifts with each other because, well, by the end of the day, they're probably all broke anyways. So imagine your life if you didn't share anything. And not just your material things. You, your emotions, your happiness, your grief, your love. If you didn't share it with anybody, pretty sure you would be a lonely person. I think the movie depicted this person as Ebenezer Scrooge. So, we weren't created to do that. We were created to share. We were created to be a part of a body. We were created to share not only our material things, but us our joy, our grief, our happiness, our, our love with other people. So when we think about the greatest gift ever given, truly it was Christ. So he did an incredible job of modeling that sacrificial giving of what that looks like. So we just sang a song, Rejoice, Rejoice, Emmanuel. 
is a line in that song. Emmanuel meaning God is with us. Rejoice, rejoice, God is with us. So if you're joyful that God is with you and you're singing this song to worship, what is your response then to that joy? Are you sharing that gift that God has given us of Christ with others? So they can experience that joy that you have in their life. So as Christmas approaches, let's share that gift with others. Let's share that gift that God has given his son with others so they can experience that joy of Christmas that we experience Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the greatest gift that anybody could ever have, the gift that you've given us of your son, Jesus Christ. Father God, give us the strength. Give us the courage to go out, to share that gift with others so they can experience the joy that we have in our daily lives, we have for eternal life with you. Everything we do, it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I love that. That fact that Clint was sharing, Emmanuel, God is with us. And, you know, in this season, we look for all the different ways that we can take time, all the different ways that we can stop and we can remember and we can give thanks and we can realize that God is with us. God wants to be with us. And, and you know, we're always looking for ways to provide that. One, one of the ways that we're going to be doing that is this evening at 6 o'clock, you're all invited to come back here and bring people with you as there's going to be a night of carols where we take song, where we take and continue to sing songs like we just sung about God being with us and, and help our hearts focus on, uh, you know, this season, what it's about, uh, why and what we have to say celebrate what we have, as he said, uh, to share with others. And, and then uh, next Sunday, um, during both services, the kids are going to present a play and, and in their way, you know, help us understand and help our hearts, you know, know and remember what the season is about, what we should be focused on. And so I invite you to be a part of that. And of course, you know, Christmas Eve, we'll be gathering on Christmas Eve morning, coming together at our services as we'll be finishing up this series. And then we'll gather that evening at 6 p.m. as we talk, as you're going to see the stage in the next couple weeks transfer form as, as, you know, we're going to present a play about, you know, just the messiness of that first Christmas Eve and all that was there, but still continues through our life here uh, today and, and that. And so many opportunities for us to take some time to stop, to remember that God is with us and what the season is about. And I encourage you to come and be a part of that and join us and invite others to be with us also. But we're going to be taking a look at the second part of this series. We, we started last week talking about with this Christmas season, how God says that our life, we can have it, we can live it to the fullest. If you remember, I said our base verse is going to be John 10, 10 that says this, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. You can have life and have it to the full. And the way we experience life to the full in, in, in Jesus is oftentimes not just counterculture, but it, it's, it's counterintuitive to what we would instinctively think in our life. I mean, we don't, I know none of us here, we, we don't want to run through life exhausted. We don't want to run through life feeling like we're empty and there, there's not much there. So how do we experience then the power that God brings to us through his son Christ when he gave us that? And, and I think Christmas unlocks some of that force and helps us to understand it. And culturally, we tend to think, I mean, when, when you hear people talk about a powerful life, I mean, you know, the things that they use to describe a powerful life, you know, life are marked by like position, privilege, fame, talent, you know, fortune, you know, affluence and everything. But when Jesus came, he didn't come with any of that. He didn't come with any of that in his life. He came in the form of weakness. So think through this. Did, did he come in a form of weakness because he was weak? I mean, the simple answer is you just read through Scripture, you say, no, because Scripture says he's always been and always will be all-powerful, but he was born in weakness. He chose weakness. Actually, Paul, when he was teaching those in, in, uh, in Philippi, he told them, he says, he made himself nothing. Why? Why would he make himself nothing? I mean, why would he be born to this average, we call average teenage uh, girl? I mean, if, if we were trying to put together our 10 you know, this list of 10 names of people, maybe bump it up to 100, that we think that, yeah, these are the ladies that could be the mother of Jesus. I don't know if Mary's resume would have even made it off of our desk to be one that we would put there, let alone Joseph, the dad. I mean, we don't know a whole lot about Joseph. We know that he was a carpenter, and we know that he struggled to make ends meet, as we say today, uh, and that, in fact, uh, when they took Jesus to the temple, 
to dedicate him, the Levitical law said that they had to purchase uh, a lamb and then sacrifice that lamb for him, but they were so poor they couldn't provide that. Now think about the irony of that. Think about how maybe Joseph felt during that time. He couldn't afford a sacrificial lamb for the actual sacrificial lamb at his birth. You know, and, and, and we know he was born in Nazareth. Back then, Nazareth was a know-nothing really community. It's really still not much today. I mean, the greatest thing Nazareth is known for is the birth of Jesus, you know, when it comes to that. And there's other things like the manger. I mean, we would think somebody, the son of God, you know, the king of kings, this guy's going to be brought in a palace, but he comes in in a manger. Is it because God didn't have the resources? No, he owns everything and has everything. It's because maybe he's a poor planner. You know, he, he needs some of you type A personality people to step in and get him organized. No, he's had this plan from the beginning, so why? And think about how we, you know, we sing this. It's like, sometimes it's like poetic, like the cattle are lowing. Ladies, how many of you would love to have cattle in the birth room when you gave birth to your children? You know, you know, want all these different animals around you while you're, I, I don't think so, you know. That's not a power move. That, that, that's not what you do to impress the world. Look, we wouldn't have done it that way. So why weakness? And I hope one of the things we can understand today in our time together is that weakness, weakness welcomes the power of God. It was true then, and it's still true today. And so we step back and we look at the story, what we call the Christmas story. We look at our Savior coming. We look at the birth coming in, and we think, well, that's not how, that's not how I, would have, I would have done it. So why did God do it that way? And he did it that way so his power could be put on display. So his power, I mean, because, I mean, think about it. If Jesus had been born to, you know, a a royal family, you know, in in politics, they they were great in politics, they had money and everything, and then people would have said, well, see, look what happens. When you have money and political power, you can do these kinds of things. Or if he would have been, you know, born into this noble, at least a noble city, people would say, well, he was born at the right time, right place. Sure, all these good things happen. Or if he was born into a family, you know, that was highly educated, and, and he received this highly educated life, and they could say, see, that's the power of education. But Jesus was born in weakness, So when you read the story, all we can do and all we can say is, wow, look what God can do. Look what God can do. This is the power of God. Weakness welcomes the power of God. It was true that first Christmas, and like I said, it's still true for us today. And this is something that Paul was trying to help uh, those in in Corinth understand. The city in in, in Corinth that he was talking to, he saw the church that had been planted and there and and that was meeting, the people that were gathering and meeting. And, 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 you know, Corinth wasn't much different than some of our cities today as far as that. You know, they dealt with wealth. They wanted power. They wanted to be known for their power. You look up their architecture, you know, and you see these big pillars and everything that they had because they had these big buildings. They wanted to be proud to show how powerful they were because they built up this great big city and, 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 you know, they wanted to prove this power. And so Paul is trying to help the church as he's coming into this, and this church is struggling and has this mindset that it's letting into that, he's like, look, at, I want you to understand something. He's, he's like, yes, I was born into the right family. He, he tells him, he says, I had the right education. I had the right credentials, and, and I had a lot of accomplishments, but I want you to understand something. He continues on. He says, you need to be very, very clear about this. You know, I want you to understand that it was God's power through my weakness Not any of those things I just listed, but God's power through my weakness that gave me every opportunity and made me as effective as I was to go out and do what God had asked me to do. It's all about God's power, not about his. And so when he was teaching and talking to those in in Corinth, he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, you know, God says to him, and some of you will recognize this, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm going to stop right there. He says, it's all you need. And sometimes I, I know we get into this world and, you know, we've talked about it many, many times. The world shows up and we think, ah, gee, I don't know if God's grace can really get me through this. But it can and it does. And it is all that we need. God's grace is always just enough for us. And, and, it, and it's just enough to get us through today. And sometimes it even spills over to tomorrow. But everything that we need to get through today, His grace is there to help us. And everything we need to get through to tomorrow will be there. And the next day, and the next day. It's always sufficient. And then Paul, he hears from God, and God says to him, and and I think God still wants us to hear this today. He said, here's how my power works best. You want to live a life full? You want to live a life full of power? Here's how you unlock that. My power works best in your weakness. 
My power, God says, works best in your weakness. And Paul's like, okay, if that's true, if that's what unlocks the power of God in my life, then the only rational response is to delight in my weakness. Not be proud of my weakness, but delight. And what he means by that is, you know, uh, to be honest about those areas that I'm weak. And I know what I just said, okay? That does not sit well with anybody in here. We do not like to be known for our weaknesses. Actually, we don't want people to know we're weak, right, church? We don't want people to, what do we want people to know? I want people, you want people, we want people to know that we're independent, that we're strong. I don't need any help. No, I'm fine. I can do this on my own. I can handle this situation. I don't need, and because why? Because I don't want people to know I need help. I don't want people to know I'm weak. But Paul says, look at, that's how you experience God's power in your life. Yeah, you can try to keep up the appearances that everything looks good. You know, come in and, hey, you know, how's it going? Great, great. You know, maintaining your image, whatever you want to call it. You can do that. But Paul says in doing that, you're missing the power of God in your life. And Paul says, I'm glad to boast. Again, not out of pride, but to be honest about my weakness is the word that's used there. And he says, I'm going to celebrate this. And in verse 10, he says this, that's why for Christ's sake, I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. You know, this is a powerful life. This is life to the full. In our weaknesses, we discover our strength and our power that we never would ever be able to find on, on our own. And so finally, he embraces it. But then the question comes to us, it's like, great, I'm, I'm happy for Paul. He embraced that. How do we do that, you know? How do we do that? And I think it's something I've shared before for us to understand is we have to make, basically in our life, make, you know, start making more, much, much more of Jesus. And this time of year in the Christmas season, that, that seems like, well, I can do that this time of year. You know, I can decorate my house. I can put up the nativity scene that's out there that shows that I believe in Jesus, you know, and I can say Merry Christmas and keep Christ in Christmas. And, you know, and I can do, and I can make much, much more this time of year of Jesus, but we forget the part that has to come with it. The second part, yes, you make much of Jesus, but also as I make much of Jesus, I make less of me, less of me. And that's not easy. That's not easy to do, you know, but, you know, it, it's just making so much more of Jesus and less of me. And we struggle, and, and if I could, I just want to give you a few things, I think, to help us celebrate our weaknesses, but I, I want us to be able to celebrate that by understanding why maybe we struggle in celebrating and being open and honest about our weaknesses. The first reason is this. I think it's difficult to do this is that reason is because we're constantly measuring ourselves by productivity and accomplishments. We're constantly measuring ourselves. Now, I talked about this six weeks ago in our other series when we kicked our other series off. I mean, we're, we're, we're taught to do this at a young age, all right? At a very, very young age. I mean, uh, if I can put it maybe just a little bit different, to celebrate your weaknesses, do not measure your worth or your value by what you produce and accomplish. And that's really difficult. That's really difficult. One of the things I struggle with is going on vacations. And it's not that I don't like to go on vacations or get away. I do. But my struggle is when I'm on these vacations, wherever I find myself is, I struggle because I'm not feeling productive, if you can understand that. You know, I might be sitting in this wonderful place. Maybe I'm sitting, you know, we've rented a cabin and we're in the woods or we're wherever we are and I'm on the porch and it's early morning and there's this brook that's going by and, you know, you're sitting there thinking, ha, ah, and I'm sipping on a cup of coffee and all I'm thinking is, I'm not being very productive. All I'm doing is finishing up a cup of coffee. Whoopee. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't feel productive. So I struggle with that aspect. And, and Melinda always says, you know, we actually need to take a couple weeks, if not more, at a time. Because the first three to four days, I'm trying to come down off that productiveness. And, you know, and, and then the, the last three to four days, I'm gearing back up to come home in that productive. So I need that time in between where I can really, really uh, relax and, and not be in that productive mode. And, and over the years, what I've come to realize is that I connect productivity to strength. I connect productivity to power in that, that somehow evidence of a powerful life is a person who has accomplished certain things. And I didn't realize how much value I was putting on those things. Uh, like I said, 
Several years ago, we took a vacation when the kids were, uh, were younger and that, and we we're going to be gone for three weeks. Uh, one of those, like five to six days, we were going to be at what was called the North American Christian Convention. And we kind of built our, our vacation to kind of be around that and to explore the area that was there. And, and uh, again, you type A personalities are going to love this. Before we took off on this three-week vacation, I made a list. Okay, I made a list of everything I wanted to accomplish while we were going to be gone, and, and that. And I started with this list. I mean, I started grabbing books that were in my office that I had started reading, and that, and then some other uh, books that I wanted to start reading. And I was like, I was going to finish these and start these other books that I wanted to be reading. And I'm making this list. I'm going to while I'm gone for these three weeks, I want to put together a plan, a health plan to help me eat more, better, and exercise better. And while I'm also gone, I want to set out six months, my next six months of at least the titles and scriptures I want to use, so I can be ahead when I come back here. You know, and and on on what I want to teach and what I want to preach. And where God wants us to go. And, and I'm making this list and we're about two days into the trip and we stop for breakfast. And, and I'm excited about my list because I don't make a lot of lists, but I was excited about this list and, 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 and all this other kind of stuff. And we're having breakfast and I'm sharing it with Melinda and I'm like, yeah, and I'm all excited. And she just kind of looks at me and she was like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you relax? And I didn't have an answer, you know? I mean, I really didn't have an answer. And the hard reality is that, that it was revealing a lack of dependence on God on my part. I mean, I felt like, oh, it depends on me, that I've got to prove value and worth by making sure that all these things are taken care of. And while we were at the North American Christian Convention, one of my mentors that I went to teach at my school, I saw him there at the booth for Hope International, uh, where I went, it was called Pacific Christian College back then, but he was a professor there. And I was talking with him and I was sharing this with him. And, you know, and, and he said, well, this is your problem. You know, Dave, he says, you attach worth and value to being productive. And he always starts off really nice and helping me understand, but, but then he always, it's like he sucker punches me, you know, all the time. I don't know why I call him, but I love the guy to death. But he says, right after that, he says, you're ashamed that you're, you're tired because you think rest is for the weak when rest is for the righteousness. Rest is for the righteousness. It's not what you think it is. It's not that you want to prove yourself. It's that you're not quite convinced that you can fully depend on God. If you were, this would be a lot easier for you. And I was just like, well, I, yeah, I know, but there's, yeah, and I'm trying to think of some good Greek stuff to throw at him or something, you know, and, and I'm just like, I, but you don't understand, I want to help. I don't want to be helped. I want to be the helper. Is that so wrong? Apparently it is. <laughs> like apparently there's something spiritually off about that. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does that mean? Blessed are those who know that they need help and are willing not just to ask for that help, but to receive that help in their lives. You see, I don't want to be rescued. I want to be the rescuer. Think about this. I don't know how many of you are into these Marvel movies and stuff like that that are out there, but you know, would you rather be Spider-Man swinging in, you know, and saving the day and that and, and stuff, or would you rather be, anybody know who his love of his life is there hanging? Go ahead and say her name if you know who she is. <laughs> Not Lois Lane. That's Superman. But it's a good illustration as well. I could have used that one too, doggone it. Okay, so see, nobody here watched the Marvel movies. So that illustration I'm throwing completely out. Mary Jane, praise God. You guys got to open up and got confessed. I got your broke through here now. Uh, okay, Mary Jane, would you rather be Spider-Man? I thought for sure everybody would know Mary Jane. She's, and, and that, and, and swinging in and saving the day. Or Mary Jane, help me, help me, you know, on that. I mean, come on, let's be honest here. Would you rather be the rescuer or, the, you know, the one doing the rescuing? And we want to be the rescuer, but the truth of the reality that Paul's trying to help us understand and this gift that God gave us his son that first Christmas is he is the only true rescuer. He is the only one that can truly rescue us and help us through whatever the world throws at us, whatever we're going through in our life. And that, that can be hard at times because we want, we want to help. We don't want people to know we need help. I got a friend that always says to me, hey, Dave, don't forget God loves you. He'd love you just as much as he does right now if you bought a house in the country and, you know, sitting on the front porch just drinking tea. And I understand what he's trying to say, but there's part of me that struggles with that, even though I biblically understand it to be true, that our worth and identity is determined by Jesus on the cross and what he has done for us on the cross. 
in that. And, and if I'm trying to produce fruit, if I'm trying to produce fruit to earn his favor, that's not pleasing. Actually, he says he treats that like filthy rags and throws it away. It's like spoiled fruit. And sometimes God has to pull that right out of our grip to get our attention sometimes in our life. You know, but again, it's difficult. Some of you know and, and are aware that when the pandemic came around again, Melinda and I got into bicycling and, and stuff. And so we go out bicycling. Now, uh, she likes to do the trails and I do too, but I like to go out in the morning on the road. You know, when I, I get up around five-ish and, and uh, you know, like to go out, there's nobody out there, really, hardly at all, in and, and that morning time, and that's what I like, uh, pretty much have the roads to myself, and, and you know, I go up in the morning, it's dark, and, but I got my lights and everything off for my safety and stuff, and, and I'm out there, and, you know, I'm just going, I'm watching the sun rise, come up, and I'm seeing that, you know, and, and it's just, I'm pedaling along, and it's just quiet. And it's still, there's nothing. I mean, I, I'm not really worried about cars. I'm more worried about in, in, in the morning, my, my, my buddies that'll come running along with the deer on the side of the road, you know, that they stay on the side of the road and don't decide to come out and say hi to me, you know, in that aspect. But I'm just, I mean, I'm seeing this nature. I'm seeing the sunrise. It's just quiet. And there's this one part on, I, I have a, several different routes, but there's this one route I do that has a real steep hill. And if I make it up without dying, which I have because I'm before you, but I make it up there, it's like there's this tree at the top. It's like God planted it there just for me because I'll get to the top and it's like, okay, it, it is a little over halfway through my route and I'll stop. You know, maybe have a protein bar, get something to drink, whatever, and I'll sit against this tree and I'll just look. I can see for a long ways. And I take that in and it's just, it's, it's just gorgeous. And sometimes I just don't say a thing. Sometimes I pray to God. Sometimes I'll read my Bible while I'm there and, and stuff, but it's just so wonderful. And that's, that's how that time it started out. But of course, the more I get used to riding, the longer I can ride. And so, the, you know, you're, you're out there, you go a certain distance, you got to come back. You know, if I, if I bike an hour out, you know, I got to turn around and bike an hour back unless I call Tyler to come pick me up. Not that that's ever happened. Uh, well, yes, it has. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, so I get out there hour, hour and a half, two hours. I've, I've got to work that way back in it. And, and so my mind that I struggle with, I'm thinking, I've got this two, two and a half, three hours that I'm out in the morning, you know, and, and sometimes on the longer routes, four hours. I need to be more productive with that time. So I start downloading, you know, podcasts or sermons that I want to listen to. I buy these, they're not earbuds, they're the, the, the jawbone type things, you know, that go around your ears so you can still hear and listen to stuff, but I can still hear traffic coming. And I start listening to these things because I'm being more productive and, and that that's there. And, and, and uh, I'm listening to that and I'm starting to bike further and further. And then I get this app. And, uh, you know, and I have this app. Why? Because it tracks my miles and it tracks my distance and my time and, and, and all that other kind of stuff. And, and I'm competitive. <laughs> and I want to see, I want to check and see, hey, I'm going on that same route today. I want to see if I can go faster and, and stuff. And so I started doing that. And then I asked Melinda to, you know, go ahead and download the same app and become a friend with me. Why? So, well, she has a way of seeing all the different stuff that I have done, <laughs> what I've accomplished, you know, and, 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 and everything and, and wh what I've done. You know, and 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 I, she can be impressive, and you know, I don't have to sit there and say, "Hey, I bike." So she can just look at the app and say, "Wow, Dave went five miles today. It took him eighteen hours, but he went five miles. Yay!" You know, and and she can be impressed. And and there was still within me this desire to not make it about input and receiving, but to make it about output and look at what I've done. Output, output, and look how strong I am, and look look what I've accomplished, and how. Everything has a way of turning in that direction if we're not careful in our life. Well, the second reason I think we struggle of making less of ourselves and more of Jesus is we're constantly preoccupied with image maintenance and always concerned with what other people think. And I, I know in our culture today, that's even more so with social media and the influencers that are out there and stuff like that, how we look at that, you know, and, and, and it's never truer than that. But if you want to delight in your weakness, you've got to let go of this preoccupation with what do people think and what are people going to say about me? What do they think and what are they going to say about me? 
There's many times in my calling where I'll see somebody post something or I'll hear somebody something or maybe they email something and, and they might be saying, and it's not truthful about me or my family or, or, or my church family. And the first thing I want to do is get on that email, you know, and tie back or get in that social media and, and have some kind of a, a response to say, hey, that's not true. I want to get on there and say, hey, some of you have heard this and, and, and that's not true. And try to post some things that would, you know, kind of passively, aggressively <laughs> make it clear that these things couldn't be true. Why? Because I want to control it. I'm concerned about what others think. Several years ago, when I was going through a situation kind of like that and struggling with that, that same mentor, Joe, that I was talking about at the North American, I gave him a call and was talking with him. And again, like I said, you know, he starts out encouraging and he said, Hey, Dave, you know, remember, you know, the Bible says that you're to consider it a blessing when people, you know, say things about you that, that aren't true. And I said, Yeah, I know. I, I get it, I get it, but it's frustrating and it's hurtful to hear people talk about it and, and, and say things like that, you know? And, and it makes me sound like I'm a moral failure. And he stopped me and, and he was like, Dave, you are a moral failure. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know, I know, Joe, I know. And, and that I, I, I understand what you mean. I know I'm a moral, well, we're all moral failures. And he says, no. And just like he says, no, Dave, you are a moral failure. And I'm like, mm. and, and, you know, uh, he says, your preoccupation with what degree of moral failure you are shows a basic misunderstanding of the gospel. And I'm on the phone. He can't see me. And I'm like, you are a moral failure. Yeah. I mean, that's me. I mean, I don't like it. My defensiveness went right up right away. But after we hung up and I took time to think about what Joe said, and I took time to pray about what he had said to me, I, I started to realize, man, that gave me such a sense of relief. Why? I don't have to fix anything. I don't have to control anything. I don't have to maintain a narrative. I don't have to post a correction. Like, it's okay. I'm a moral failure. You know, that should be my new Facebook post today. Now thinking about it, I'm a moral failure. And my friends, that's why we celebrate the gospel. That's what, that's what makes, room, makes room for God's grace to be so sufficient in our life. That's what makes room for his power to be made perfect in our life. And listen, I know, I know from myself that, that when I get too caught up in what other people think, what other people are saying, the reason we do that is because we're thinking way too much about ourselves. We're way too concerned. We're way too worried about ourselves. And we're not focused on what we need to be focused on and paying attention to what we were paying attention. We're becoming preoccupied with, with the wrong thing, with self. And I understand we want to defend ourselves. We want to maintain our social standing. We want to, to prove our worthiness. We want to impress people with our strengths and our accomplishments. I understand all that. But here's the thing. It's in weakness that you will finally experience God's power to the full. It's in weakness that you know that. And I think one of the most beautiful examples of that is John the Baptist. Uh, that we're, we're in John here, and, and John the Baptist didn't write this. This is John. John's not writing about himself. I know this is confusing. John's writing about a guy named John the Baptist. And in verse 6 of chapter 1, he says this. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. He's, he's not the light. He's just pointing them that way. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. So he's not the light. He's just, again, directing people to that. And that's, that's how John introduces him. And you continue to read on, you, you will see he starts to get more popular. His social media starts to get more likes, if you will, you know, and today. And these religious leaders want to know who he is. So they come to him down in verse 21, and they ask him. They say, they asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no, I'm not. And finally, they said, then who are you? And here's this opportunity to tell them his name and give a history and all this other kind of stuff. But he answers them with scripture from Isaiah. I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. Who are you? I'm just a voice. And then the next day, the next day, scripture tells us that John's teaching the crowds, okay? And you have to understand this. He's standing, he's got a multitude of people that are coming out, a multitude of people that are facing him, that are looking at him, that are listening to him teach about this man named Jesus and, and, and you know, and, and who he is, and he's baptizing them and just all of them. And, and in the distance, you know, here comes this person over this hill or whatever. And, and at first he doesn't recognize, I mean, as he's teaching, many people are coming, you know, and, but as he gets closer, he realizes that this is the one he's been teaching about. This is the 
one he's been baptizing people. This is the one he's been telling about, get ready, he's going to come. And in his best King James voice, he says to them, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And everybody that's there turns and faces Jesus. And John's like, now, this is why I'm born. Everybody's looking at Jesus. I see their backs. They're not focused on me. They're looking at Christ. My whole purpose is to point people to the truth, to the true light, to the Savior, to Jesus. And then in in chapter 3, verse 20, or excuse me, verse 30, he says this, he must become greater and I must become less. He must become greater and I must become less. That's, That's what this is. That's what Christmas is about. This is what what celebrating your weakness looks like, that he must become greater and I must become less. And when we understand that and live that, there's so much freedom in that. You know, John the Baptist says, look, don't worry about me. Look to him. So stop listening to me. Start, Start listening to him. And the more we embrace our weaknesses, the more opportunity we have to point people to Jesus and the sufficiency of God's grace and the fullness of his power in our life each and every day. But we have to understand what that is. We have to be willing to be open about that and to share that. And that's really, really difficult, I understand. Back in Iowa, when I was there, our leadership went on a leadership retreat. And at the end of it, the speaker, he said, as as you leave today, I'm going to challenge you uh, to do this. He says, I want you to think about 10, 11, 12 people that you know that you spend time with. And I want you to ask them to give you three things that they feel is a weakness of yours. You know, three things that maybe you need to improve, get, get stronger in, in your life. And I'm sitting there listening to this assignment, and I'm thinking, nope, not going to do it. Not going to do it. That's hard. I don't want to do it. I don't want to hear it uh, on these people. But I knew with the other elders that were with me that they were going to hopefully do it, and we were probably going to have a meeting and discuss it. So I went ahead and came back, found 10 people uh, that I felt comfortable in, in doing that with, and I gave that to them and said, hey, Three things that you think I'm weak in, that I need to improve in my life, you know? And, and, and that's hard. You might be sitting there thinking, it's just three simple questions, Dave. If that's what you're thinking, I dare you to try it this week, okay? Find two people, okay, and, and, and do that with. And, and it was hard, but I did that. And the responses started coming in. There was one person, you know, who didn't listen and, of course, uh, you know, went past the three, went way, way past the three. But there was nothing I can do. I was married to her, so I just had to take it. <laughs> You know, but, but I waited till they all came in before I read them. And I didn't want to read them at home. I didn't want to go to my office and read them because, again, you know what I'm asking them to point out. They're, I'm asking them to point out my weaknesses, things I might not like about me. And I'm sure my defenses, if you're around me, my defenses could pop up. And, you know, and, and especially when I was younger, uh, you know, it might not always look pleasant when my defenses popped up. So I didn't want that to be seen at home. I didn't want it to be seen in my office. So I went uh, south about eight miles to this little town called Jewel in Jewel, Iowa, to this place called Little Wall Lake. Um, really nice little place. It was right there. And I started opening them and I started reading them. And as I opened and reading them, I I thought at first, you know, I I was just going to be criticized, but I felt cared for, you know, I thought I was going to be frustrated and defensive. I was going to be hurt and I was going to be mad, you know, because I'm finally going to be seen. That's not easy. (laughs) It's like, I thought I was, you know, I'm reading these things and it's like, oh my gosh, I thought I was doing a much better job in covering that up, you know, or not letting that be known or wow, they didn't just know the three things. They knew a lot more than three things that was pointed out that was there. They knew all this about me and they loved me. They loved me and it was okay. And that's why I'm constantly praying for God's church. That's what I'm praying for you, that you can experience that feeling of not being lonely, but instead of having people around you who know you and see you and love you and love you, you know? And, and, and I know, again, that can be difficult because, you know, um, the, the church, it's the people as we teach and, and we have that. And we're imperfect people. We make mistakes, and stuff, and maybe your experiences. Well, yeah, there was one time I decided to get open and to talk about this, and 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 about my weakness, or to share this, or to confess a sin, or whatever that is. And and in doing so, and as I was doing this, you know, instead of being you know people talking to me, they talked about me now, and they looked differently at me, and I felt looked down upon with it. It was a very negative experience, and and and, and yeah, so I don't feel safe in a place you know doing this, and 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 I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry if, if you've had that experience, but I also want you to understand that this is not how God sees you. You know, 
God doesn't see you and look at you and judge what, when it comes to that aspect. That's not how he sees you and what he wants you to understand when you come to him with those kinds of confessions, those, that kind of openness of, of your weakness. I mean, we can try the best that we want to, to, whatever they call it today, posing or pretending, you know, in front of other people. And even if we want to in front of God, but definitely with God, it doesn't do any good. I mean, there's people out there that you think they might not know. They know. I don't know how they know. They know, <laughs> you know, different things. They might not know at all, but they know. But God knows it all. God sees it all and God knows it all. That's why at this season, that's one of the things I hope we can focus on and realize. That's why we sing, I bring you good news of great joy because a Savior has been born. And whatever those weaknesses are that you struggle with, when we take them to that Savior that grew up, that that baby that was born some 2,000 years ago, grew up to be a man that shed and went to the cross and defeated death and says, look it, I'm the way, the truth, and life. When we take that to him, all of that list is erased. Jesus came in weakness because he came for weak people, which... That's who we are. That's who we are. And so as we get ready to come before these elements here this morning, I can't think of a, of a better prayer, a, be, a better way this year to help us prepare our hearts as we go through this Christmas season is maybe to pray the prayer that like John the Baptist, God, please help me more of Jesus, less of me. You know, when you wake up in the morning, say, Lord, I, I, I don't know who you're going to put in my path today. I don't know who I'm going to see today. I don't know who I'm going to talk to. But through that whole conversation, through ever how I live, may it be more of Jesus. May I be able to point them to Jesus. May I see their backsides like John the Baptist saw their backsides. And may they be looking at Jesus because I'm able to help them see Jesus and point them to Jesus. What a great prayer. You know, we delight in our weaknesses by delighting in our dependency on God. We turn to people. We turn to him. And it shows that we're ready to receive his power. You're acknowledging you need it. More of Jesus, less of him. I encourage you to live that way as we approach Christmas. But as we also, like I said, come before these elements and we take these elements and, and, and you think about and give thanks and praise that there's a God that sent his one and only son that came in the form of a babe and loved us and demonstrated so much love that it's hard sometimes to grasp our mind around. Also take some time and just let God's spirit speak to your heart. You know, are, 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 would, you, would you be willing today, right now, before you left this building, just pick somebody out of here and share your weakness? Wow, that's tough. You know? Well, and, and I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking you to think, are you, but some of your eyes went, no, what's he doing? You know, I'm just asking you, you know, just to think about that. If, if not, why? Well, maybe I don't, I don't know people in here. I haven't built a relationship well enough. And maybe that's why God's brought you here. First and foremost, the only way you can do it is with the power of God in your life. And secondly, that's by is what we talk about, building these relationships and getting to know people and building that trust. Maybe that's what he brought you here to challenge you to hear as well. You know, helping people be that light, but also looking and realizing you're not doing life alone. You got people you can lean on here and they want to be there and walk with you. So as we go before these elements and we take that, let's remember, let's celebrate, let's give thanks, and don't leave today. You know, if, if you want to talk or pray with the leadership about something that's going on or a struggle that's there, we're here for you. If you're watching online right now and, and, and you know, you're struggling and you understand that, give us a call. Come on in this week, you know, and check with us. We would love to talk with you. We, we would love to be there and pray with you. But right now, let's just go before them as we prepare our hearts. Father, I thank you for this time. This time that we can come before these elements and what they mean and what they represent. A love from a God who created us, who knows us, who has been there for us from the beginning and wants the best of the best for us. And we praise you and thank you for being that kind of God and for loving us that way and sending your son. Sending your son, Father God. And we rejoice. We rejoice that Emmanuel, God, is with us as we've heard from the beginning, Lord, and what that means. And Father, as we give thanks and praise, we also ask that your Holy Spirit just... Father God, speak to our hearts. Lord, are we willing? Are we willing before you? Are we willing before others just to share our weaknesses? Just to admit that we have weaknesses? So Father, you can come in and your grace and your power can be there to work in our lives in maybe ways we haven't imagined. Father God, give us the understanding of how to do that today. Lord, thank you again for this time that we could come, we could give thanks and praise, and we could celebrate you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Expected Jesus.
Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. House lights, George. We're getting ready here. I'm going to pray us out, but uh, today is the day that we do our vote for our annual 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 budget. Um, and so, um, if uh, you've uh, placed membership here, we're asking you uh, to s- just stay seated. And they're going to bring around these little cards. It's real simple. Uh, there's a yes on there, and when you check that yes, it means yep. I'm going to do everything I can in 2024 to support the financial things that the leadership and staff have been praying for, thinking and talking about, where God wants us to go. And and that that's what yes means. Uh, if you check no, um, we we have a spot there with it that. We just want to know why. We want to know why so we can know how to better minister to you when it comes to that and, and stuff. Uh, you don't have to put your names on these uh, when you put them out. But uh, So I'm going to pray. Members, if you could stay and, and that, and then they'll be passing out the cards when you're done. You can give them back to one of the leadership there with it or raise your hand and they'll come get it. And, uh, um, and that's how simple it is. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time again, this time of celebration that we could be in your presence and, and, and come together corporately and worship you, Heavenly Father. Father, and what that means and the blessing that is to us, Heavenly Father. Thank you again for this day. And as we go out, Father, as we go out, may we share, may we share with others as we've been challenged in so many different times and ways that, that our God is with us and that makes a difference in our lives. Thank you for that truth. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless everyone. Worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ, the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ.